this year, for the second time, Wageningen University and Research is going to organize the Rethink Protein Challenge. We challenge you to come up with a sustainable solution to meeting protein needs of 9 billion people. Just like we need to change the way we produce and consume our energy, we need to change the way we produce and consume our food. The protein transition is happening and you can be a part of it. By joining the challenge, you learn about the topics you're fascinated by, but in a different, more creative way than in a traditional lecture room. You develop your entrepreneurial and professional skills and meet people of industry who can help you boost your career. And if you make it to the finals, you get a place in the spotlight and a chance to win part of the 15,000 euro prize pool. So join the Rethink Protein Challenge now. now. We don't hear you, Marta. Yes. Hi, welcome everybody. Welcome to the Rethink Protein Info Meeting. It's super nice to meet you all here. We are now with 70 people in this room. And even though we cannot see each other, we can feel each other energy. And it's going to be a very inspiring meeting, I hope. My name is Marta Ehers. I work for Vue Student Challenges, which is organizing the Rethink Protein Challenge. With me in the studio today is Stacy Payet. Um, hi, Stacy. Um, Program Manager, uh, Protein for Lives at Wageningen University and Research. She's also a person with huge experience in the field of uh, protein transition and a member of the group that is advising us on the Rethink Protein Challenge. We have prepared an inspiring program for you, so we will start with Stacey's presentation that will hopefully introduce you to the protein transition context, the context of this challenge, but also inspire you and ignite your problem-solving skills. Um, then I'm going to give some presentation about Riffing Protein Challenge and hopefully uh, provide all the most important information about it. And then the floor is yours. So we are open for all the questions that you have on that topic. Uh, before we move on, I would like to tell you about the event that is coming up on 1st of December. So if you are into this topic, uh, we have invited two researchers from Wageningen University to, to, take a, uh, to talk about the things that they are doing on um, replacing animal protein. So we'll have a speaker on duckweed, uh, duckweed as a source of protein and a speaker on uh, plant meat. So if you are interested, uh, check out the link to the webinar. And before we move on, I want to tell you that, uh, well, we cannot see each other, that's a, that's a big pity, but we have a chat and this is the way to have the communication going. So you can use the chat to ask us any questions, obviously, but I, I would like to recommend it to, uh, I would like to, like to recommend it, you to uh, use it to get to know each other a little bit. Uh, and maybe if you are looking for team members or looking for members to join your team or people with whom you can form the team, you can also use it to, to, to get to know each other, to connect because you can send private messages. So uh, I guess now the floor is yours, Stacy. I will load your presentation. Oh, Everybody great. enjoy this uh, webinar and I will see you soon. Thank you. So as Marta said, I'm a colleague from uh, Wageningen University in Research. Um, and I'm a program manager. Um, my program is everything to do with, with proteins. Um, and what I do as a program manager is I try to have an overview of the different things that are going on. And I spend most of my time engaging with what we call our stakeholders. Um, those are representatives from the industry, policymakers, um, philanthropic organizations, et cetera, and uh, help them understand what we're doing, what our science is, and how we can help them. 
Um, so I want to talk about um, the the future of protein. And I think, you know, if you're on this call today, you know, there are very good reasons to, to think hard about how we're working with protein and how our protein systems look. Um, chief among them, I think, you know, moving toward a more sustainable food system overall. At the same time, there are some sort of very black and white statements out there and some sort of misconceptions that we are working hard to try and address and to try and bring a little bit more quantitative and science-based dialogue uh, to that. So I titled my protein myths and realities, uh, and I wanna walk you through some of the common misconceptions and how we as Vacanian think about them. So let's start with one. Um, I hear a lot of presentations that start with, we need more protein to feed the growing global population to 9 billion. Um, and I just wanna address that question. Very fundamental question, do we have enough protein? Um, and I'm going to answer that really quickly and say, yes, we do. We have enough. Uh, if we look back to 1965 and we track where we are today, we can see that our uh, global protein supply has been growing linearly. Um, we are currently getting close to producing 500 million tons of protein per year. And that's really protein. That's not the sort of volume of the crop. It's really specifically the protein content of anything we're producing. Um, what you see in the different bars. Uh, can I move myself, my own so video? No, can somebody move me down so we can see the, um, if not, I'll just tell you. So the blue piece of this graph is uh, protein that's being used for feed. The orange part is protein that's being used for food. There's a little bar that's called other. Those are other uses like um, if you buy sliced cheese, there's a kind of paper in that sliced cheese, which is actually a, a, a food quality protein that's used to make that paper because it's in contact with, uh, with the cheese. So that's sort of the other category, other uses of protein. And then um, there's some protein in the, in the crops that we grow and we use them for seed. So that's that other small piece. Uh, in total, about 220 million tons of protein are made for food for, per year. Um, and then, you know, another uh, big chunk of this, a couple hundred uh, million tons being used for feed. That feed food ratio, so the percentage of the proteins that we're making for feed has increased since 1965. Um, and it's actually at about 0 0.9 in, in 2010. I asked the question, do we have enough protein? If we calculate the minimum required to feed 9 billion people, how much protein would we need? And that's really the minimum. So we're assuming that everybody needs, every adult needs about 50 grams of protein per day. Um, we come up with 175 million tons being what we need. So we're producing way more protein than we need, in fact. Another question that I often get is, yeah, yeah, but the, you know, the protein supply has been growing, but the population has also been growing. Um, so this is the same data, but then just calculated on the basis of uh, uh, population. And you can see here that also here, you know, we've got plenty of protein An average adult requires about 18 kilograms of protein per year. And I don't know if you can read it, but we're getting close to uh, 70, 75 grams uh, of protein, uh, kilograms of protein being produced per person per year. So ample protein. And then you might ask yourself, well, what on earth is happening? Because obviously there are still places where protein is, is an undersupply. So one thing that's definitely happening uh, and it's happening across most rich world countries is protein overconsumption. Um, this is a, a snapshot of Europe. In this map, we've colored things an increasingly deep shade of purple based on how much protein we are over consuming. Um, and those, I don't know how easy it is for you to see the, the difference in the red and green, but those are reflecting what percentage of the protein is, uh, is coming from animal versus plant sources. Here in the Netherlands, uh, we are pretty typical. Uh, consumption of about 70, 80 grams of protein per person per day. And remember that 18 kilos was about 50 grams per person per day, which was uh, the minimum requirement for an adult. Uh, and we're seeing that well over half, you know, closer to, to two thirds, 60 to 70% of the protein is typically coming from, from animal sources. And we do need, you know, we need more than one kilogram of protein produce in order to produce uh, one kilogram of animal protein because we need to feed animals protein to get them to convert that into other protein. And I'll come back to that later. But number one, what's happening to all this extra protein that we have? Well, we're over consuming it and we're eating a lot of animal protein. 
And number two, what's happening to uh, uh, to reduce our efficiency in our protein system is basically loss in waste. If we add up all the loss in waste that we can find across the globe, it's about 108 million tons per year, which is huge, huge, right? If you think back to that number of 175 million being what we need to feed 9 billion people. Um, we can figure out where that is. Some of it is post-consumer waste, but some of it is also um, being lost in the in the production system. So you see oil crops, uh, which is a big category that's actually, um, you know, plant material that we grow for the purpose of oil, like rapeseed here in Europe or sunflower or canola. Um, we take the oil out, and the rest of that is actually at this moment not always used as a as a useful protein in our feed or food system. So definitely room for improvement here as well in reducing our protein loss and waste. Okay, so that was hopefully an answer to the question of, do we have enough protein? Um, another thing that we see out there is a kind of polarization in meat eaters versus vegans and a kind of black and white um, with, with people on both sides of this argument feeling very uh, convinced of their position. So let's just ask ourselves the question of, you know, what does the science say? Is it a great idea? Should we eat vegan? So to start with, we should talk about what we mean when we talk about sustainability. Um, and at Vakening and we take very much a kind of what we call a food systems approach. So it's not quite right to say that any source is inherently sustainable or unsustainable. It really depends on how we're producing it. Got a picture of chickpeas there and you would think, yeah, chickpeas, that seems pretty sustainable. And, you know, I would agree with you, sustain chickpeas have the potential to be a very sustainable source. But on the other hand, if I take those chickpeas and I fly a can of chickpeas twice around the world, I think you would all agree with me that those chickpeas are not, not really sustainable anymore. Um, so it's better to talk about how a food product is produced inside of a system and to think about whether we can create a sustainable system rather than a single source, which is very sustainable. Um, from plants, and we do think that plants have the potential to be very sustainable sources of proteins, um, but I think we should also be talking about not just how sustainable is it to grow a chickpea, we also have to talk about the yield that we're getting when we're growing that chickpea, where are we growing it? Here in the Netherlands, we can't grow chickpeas very efficiently, um, so that makes them not a very sustainable crop because we can't grow them with a very high uh, yield per hectare. We also need to talk about protein content. A chickpea, for example, is 17 or 18% protein. And we have to think very cleverly about what we're gonna do with the rest of the material that we're growing if we're growing a lot of chickpeas for protein. We have to look at the extraction energy in some materials. It does cost us a lot of energy, like with algae or with seaweed, for example. If we wanna get protein out, we do have to put in a lot of energy to get that protein out. And that reduces the potential uh, for making this a sustainable protein source. We also have to talk about yield. It's very typical when we're extracting protein that we only get half of the protein that's in there out, um, meaning that this chickpea, if it's 18% protein, we're actually getting 9% protein uh, when we're creating food ingredients out of that chickpea. We have to think about distribution and we have to think about further processing for now if you're buying, for example, a plant-based meat, burger, um, meat, uh, <laughs> then it's probably using an extrusion process and extrusion does cost us a lot of energy as well. All in all, when we make a calculation about whether plant-based burgers make sense, yes, they do, but still they're not as good as they could be. If we could work on all these different points and make our system a little bit better to address them, we could get pretty far uh, to make those plant-based burgers more sustainable. Another important concept that I want to introduce to you when we're talking about sustainability, um, and excuse me, this is probably familiar to everybody, so I'll start a little bit basic. Um, animals are protein converters, right? Just like us, animals need to eat something to make, to make their body tissue. Um, so we have to feed them a certain amount of protein in order for them to create their, their body mass. The amount of protein that we need for them to create a kilo of body mass, that's what we call the feed conversion ratio. And that gets a lot of attention. Uh, there are different numbers out there based on whether you're calculating a kilogram of beef or you're calculating a kilogram of protein or you're calculating steak or whatever. Um, 
And it is an important concept. So for example, if you talk about feed conversion ratio of chicken, we can typically get a kilogram of chicken meat out by feeding a chicken about two kilograms of protein. And with a cow, we're looking at eight, even up to 20 if we're talking about very premium beef. Um, so we need to put in a lot more feed into a cow than the amount of feed that we need to put into a chicken to get a kilogram of meat out. On the other hand, it is important to say uh, that we are big fans of understanding the unforeseen consequences. And um, there's an, another concept to introduce, which is called feed food competition. What we want is for the animals to eat things that we humans cannot eat. So food side streams, agricultural side streams, marginal lands are very important sources of what we're going to feed to our animals. And if we come back to this sort of chicken cow dialogue, if you're only looking at the feed conversion ratio, you would say, hey, chickens are way more efficient, great. On the other hand, the feed that a chicken eats is largely similar to material that we humans could, could potentially also be eating. Whereas a cow, for example, we can feed a cow grass, we can put them out on pasture land, they can eat many things because they're ruminants that we as humans can't. So we developed a vision for how we can most efficiently use animals in our food system that eliminates all of that feed food competition. And our vision is that animals uh, are most efficient and most effective when we use them as so-called recyclers. So we give them everything that we as humans can't eat or can't use. Uh, residual streams, marginal lands, including for example, grasslands uh, and, and open waters. If we'd make a calculation for Europe about what that means in terms of how much animal protein should we be eating, we come to uh, about 25 grams per person per day. So if we were to agree that the only animals we're going to keep are animals who would eat things that humans can't eat, there's no competition between animals and humans for, for, for feed and food, then this is the amount. And if you remember, I told you an average adult needs about 50 grams per day. Um, what we're typically eating right now is closer to 75 grams per day. So if you're eating the minimum amount of protein, about half of your protein from animal sources, or if you're eating an average amount in a rich country right now, about a third of it from animal sources would be the most optimal, and in our view, the most sustainable diet, because we're able to use this leftover, this side stream, this marginal land to produce animals. So that was the question of should we be vegan with the answer of no, but we definitely should be eating a little bit less animal protein than we're doing now if we want to avoid feed food competition. So let's pick up the third uh, big question that's out there in this domain, are plant-based foods healthier? And I think that we need to talk a little bit about what do we mean um, when we're talking about proteins and health and nutrition. So to start with, um, we humans require nine essential amino acids from our diets. We can't synthesize those in our bodies. Um, and most animal source proteins do provide what we call complete amino acid nutrition, which means that they're giving us all nine of the amino acids that we need. And many plant sources are low in one or more of these specific uh, essential amino acids. However, that's not really a big problem. If you were going to tell me that you're only going to eat peas from now on, then it would be a problem because peas are deficient in a, a specific amino acid. On the other hand, if you eat peas at dinner time and at lunchtime, you've had some bread or at some point in your day, you're having rice, no problem because the categories of legumes and grains tend to balance each other out and ultimately you end up getting complete uh, amino acid nutrition. So as long as you eat a varied diet, this is not really something you need to worry about. And it's not something of major concern if we're transitioning to a more plant-based diet. Another important distinction between plant proteins and animal proteins is there are um, certain factors present in plants which can make their protein less easily accessible to digestion or less bioavailable, less bioavailable. Um, some of those we call anti-nutritional factors. There are specific components inside the plant which actually reduce our ability to digest the proteins. Uh, another impact, impactful factor can be what we call plant matrix effects. So that's a kind of a, a cell wall typically of carbohydrates, which can be hard to digest and prevent us from accessing the protein. But I will say, uh, although those are present and they may decrease the ability uh, we have to get all of the protein out if we're eating a plant, 
for most consumers living in rich world countries, we are over consuming protein, we're getting ample protein, we're getting a sufficiently large variety of protein, that this is actually not a problem. And some of those same compounds, especially those anti-nutritional factors, some of them actually seem to have positive health benefits. So some of the phytochemicals which are present in plants, they seem to be good for us as such, even if they're reducing our ability to digest the protein. If I were to sum all of this up into some recommendations, um, now for sure, the only diet we can convincingly call healthy that is scientifically based healthy is more fruits and vegetables, whole grains and legumes. This is basically the recommendation that pretty much every government body who's trying to make nutrition regulations is making to us right now. Uh, we need to eat more fruits and vegetables, whole grains and legumes. If we look specifically at protein, uh, refining pr plant proteins can increase their digestibility and bioavailability, but also, as I mentioned in the previous slide, probably leads to less of the goodness of plants, some of those phytochemicals being taken out. And we don't think that we should do that. In fact, for most rich country consumers, it's probably better to err on the side of the goodness of plant and better to stick to consuming whole plants where those phytochemicals are still present and not necessarily worry too much about whether we're getting optimal digestion of our protein. That said, there are a few very specific target groups, and in particular here in the Netherlands, our elderly consumers tend to get insufficient protein. So if we're making products that are oriented toward elderly consumers, then we do need to err on the side of getting their protein optimally digestible and optimally available. So, okay, very short, that was in a nutshell, <laughs> three big questions uh, in the domain of protein transition. Do we have enough protein? Yes, we do. We don't need more protein. We probably need a different protein system. It would be great to transition to sources of protein that can be a part of an optimally sustainable system. Is that optimal sustainable system based on everyone eating vegan? No, probably not. Animals are helpful because they can eat things that we can't eat. That does include fewer animals than we have right now, for example, in Europe, and eating less animal source foods than we're currently eating here. Number three, are plant-based foods healthier? Well, it depends really on what kind of plant-based food you're eating. It depends also on who you are. Um, definitely healthier fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes, unless you're, for example, an elderly, elderly person, in which case we do need to look through the lens of protein and find out how to get you high quality protein. And I'll just end with this. This is our vision on how Europe can look in 2050. Um, I didn't talk about it today, but optimizing oceanic farms to get us better use of, uh, of the sea and the oceanic resources. How does the land look? Pulse and grain production, those are complementary in terms of nutritional quality and based on a selection of crops that we can produce efficiently here in Europe. What do we eat? Optim optimally about a third of our protein from animal sources and two thirds based from plant based and working a little bit to get closer to the, the minimum amount of protein and reduce our overconsumption. And how is our food sourced and distributed based on a circular food system that keeps all of those lost and wasted streams into our protein system in an optimal way. And with that, I'll end my talk and I'll invite you to share some questions. Stacy, thanks a lot. Uh, we have some questions indeed. Uh, let me just close your presentation, put you on full screen. <laughs> let me see. So if I go to the chat mode, we had we had one clarifying question. What does refining pro uh, plant protein means? Yeah, so when I talk about refining, um, I'm talking about that process of going from for example, a whole chickpea, um, if we take that whole chickpea, the first step we do is grind it up into a flour, and that's not refining because we have the whole chickpea still present. The step after that is what I call refining, where we separate the starch, fiber, and protein that are present in that chickpea, chickpea from each other. Um, that's a very typical process that we apply it in the food industry um, to get to rather pure protein. So very typical is a what we call a, a, um, 
a protein isolate, which is 90% pure, that's a very typical ingredient going into current plant-based foods, plant-based yogurts, and plant-based meats. Okay, thanks. And then we had another question from uh, Joanna. Could the waste from all crops could, uh, be used to feed livestock in a more circular system? I don't know if you see the question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's in fact a, a, a very important part of our vision on the, the circular animal system is trying to use those industrial side streams to feed them to animals. Um, it is done more, I would say the Netherlands has a, a, a is closer to having a circular animal system than some other parts of the world, but absolutely that's a, a very important and, and high potential direction to go. The real challenge in achieving that at scale is the fact that, that soy is still the cheapest source of protein, even cheaper, for example, than some of the cider waste streams. Um, and for that reason, soy is still the, the most common feed. So we're actually importing soy from South America and we're using that to feed livestock. Um, and then we have these other side streams which are more or less going to waste. It's unfortunately a very far from optimal system, but it's the most economic choice for a lot of um, livestock holders at the moment. Okay, thanks. And then Saki was, uh, is asking, you explained how Europe 2050 would look like. Uh, how would the third world look like in terms of production, consumption, technology, and trade of protein uh, materials with Europe? Yeah. Just yeah. a short question. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Yeah, easy. <laughs> well, I think there are a few things we can um we can highlight in um in, in places where there are um you know currently protein scarcity. For one thing, actually I, I talked about us wanting to reduce the number of animals we have in our food system here in Europe. Um we actually don't think that we need to reduce the number of animals we have. Globally, in fact, there are parts of the world that would benefit from an increased access to animal proteins to address some of the nutritional needs. Uh, something like 20% of children worldwide suffer from stunting because they're not getting sufficient protein nutrition um, and access, for example, to, to dairy products would be really helpful. So that's number one. Um, I think you know our vision also includes that a circular system is beneficial anywhere because that's how we sort of make the most optimal use of our resources and and we are running some projects to understand how uh some side streams some some waste streams that are present in um you know in in countries that don't have sufficient access to protein right now can help us something like cassava leaves um they have an interesting protein in there but cassava leaves are are not being used right now. There are some challenges there, some some components in the plant that make them hard to eat and hard to use as feed. Um, and we'd like to see how we can tackle those challenges to facilitate a, a more circular system. So the circularity topic is basically a global one for us. Cool. And we get kind of quite a lot of questions, it. so <laughs> I have to be picky now. Um, there was a question about uh, macroalgae. Uh, yes, like the question is, would you uh, discourage mi microalgae protein solutions because of the amount of energy needed to extract the protein? Um, that depends on what we're talking about. If we're talking about the current microalgae streams um, that are approved for use in, in, in food, then yeah, the energy input is really a limiting factor and we either need a process that's gonna get the protein out in a much more efficient way, um, or we need to think about using the microalgae for non-human directions because we humans can't digest the, that, that sort of cell wall, uh, if you will. Um, so we humans eating an algae that's not processed with a lot of energy don't have much benefit from it. That's different for fish, that's different uh, for animal, for chickens, for example. So right now, you know, using, oh, I'm sorry, I, I was thinking about microalgae and the question is about both. I'm talking about microalgae so far. Um, so using microalgae could be very helpful um, in, in, in feed, for example. Macroalgae, which is seaweed, actually doesn't contain that much protein. It has a lot more alginate than protein in there. Uh, and the information that we have so far is it's going to be very hard 
to motivate um, growing and harvesting macroalgae or seaweed um, from the perspective of the protein. You would need to build a business case around all the components that are present in there for it to make sense. Okay. Uh, I think I would like to wrap up with a last question, which will be a combination of three questions uh, <laughs> around the topic of replacing meat. Uh, and for the other questions, could you then uh, join in on the chat and answer them uh, by uh, in a chat? The, uh, no, the, sure. the remaining okay. questions, yeah? Okay, okay. So, so let me just start. Yeah, there is a question, is plant-based uh, meat more nutritional than traditional meat? That's one part of the one question. Okay. <laughs> and then the, the other part of the question is, uh, what plant-based protein source has the most potential to be uh, used as meat replacer? And the last one, the last part of the question, the, do insects have potential to be used as, uh, as protein source to replace meat? So let's combine three questions in one and wrap up discussion for the moment. Okay, uh, then you get a three part answer. So this might be <laughs> this <might> complicated. <laughs> um, so about the nutritional um, characteristics of plant-based meat, there's a short answer to that, which is no, it's not more nutritious than meat. In fact, um, it might be less nutritious than the meat, depending how you're looking. Most of the plant-based meats have a lower protein content than meat itself. Um, sometimes also a lower fat content, which you might view as a good thing, and often a higher fiber content, which you also might view as a good thing. However, Many of them that are out there right now are made with highly refined ingredients. There's a lot of processing going into them and a lot of, um, yeah, well, a lot of complex ingredients. Um, and we really don't know how those are contributing to our, our sort of well being and health. Uh, we would rather stick to less processed foods. Um, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes. And, you know, I don't know what to say about these burgers that are originally starting from plant material, but then very highly refined and highly processed. Is that a good thing? I'm not too sure. Um, second, what kind of sources are useful for that? Right now, soy and, soy and wheat are the ones that actually give us the best performance. They're not being used because consumers love them. They're being used because if you want to get a meaty texture, that's the easy way to go. We see a lot of development with um, the category of legumes. So you see mung bean being increasingly used, you see pea protein being increasingly used. They're interesting, but they're harder to make more, they're harder to make functional. They're also more expensive than, um, than soy and wheat. We also see a category emerging from plant side streams like green leaves. Um, and I'm also personally very interested in the field of fermentation derived proteins like mycoproteins, which are coming from yeast or fungi, um, or also from bacteria. I'm, long answers, I'm sorry. <laughs> the last That's long question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, just to touch on insects. Um, Insects are animals too, right? So we have to feed insects um, protein for them to be able to make protein. So they're a converter. They're not necessarily giving us new protein, they're converting protein. Um, are they interesting for uh, meat replacement? You know, insects are more efficient animals. They're very efficient. They can have a feed conversion ratio of 1.2 or 1.8. So potentially, um, on the other hand, how many of us are eager to eat insects? I don't know. Our thinking is that insects are probably going to be a niche. We're probably not going to feed them our highest quality feed. They're going to be useful for us when we can upcycle, um, upcycle things, upcycle waste, basically. Uh, I heard, you know, some smart thing like working on an insect burger, if you can make it delicious. Okay. Uh, I heard from a company that was making an insect-based falafel, and I thought, Oh, that's kind of that's going from a chickpea to uh, <laughs> an animal. That that doesn't sound like the right way. So just you know, think about it carefully whether you're you're filling the right gap. Okay. Oh, thanks a lot for the answers and for the presentation, Stacy. There are quite some remaining questions in the chat. I have marked them with cues. So okay, if you great. could uh, stay with us on the chat and answer those questions, then I will say thank you. And I will move to the next presentation. 
Okay. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Stacey. Uh, okay. So now moving on to the Rethink Protein Challenge. Uh, I think that most of you are here because of the challenge. Perhaps you have already registered. Perhaps you are considering registering. Um, in 2019, we have uh, organized the first edition of this challenge. And uh, the edition that we organized this year is a, a, a revised uh, format. Uh, so we, we kept the good things, but we have also included a lot of new elements uh, to this challenge. And I, I am, I'm now going to take you through the most important elements of this challenge. Can you see? Yes. Uh, so what is the challenge about? It's, it's a very open challenge. So we have defined this uh, very broad call, come up with a business idea or a prototype that helps provide 9 billion people with enough protein in a way that is healthy, affordable, and good for our planet. So that's quite broad, and it's purposefully broad. Uh, and we don't want to take you in any in in, in any way uh, or in one, any specific direction with, with our call. So there were some questions in the chat. Uh, is it about vegan? No, it's not specifically about vegan. You can also think about solutions that uh, uh, that are related to animals, to uh, to closing the cycles on the farm. It's very broad. I, I have put on the slide some examples from the previous editions. So uh, one of the winning concepts uh, considered silkworm uh, as a source of protein. Um, there was also a kind of a fast food restaurant that used uh, fried snacks with insect meat. There were insect brownie kits, so as you see, quite a lot of insect ideas. But there were also some uh, ideas with uh, proteins from algae. We had also a question about that. And if you want to uh, get inspired from what has been proposed uh, in the previous edition, we have put the link uh, to the website in our chat. Uh, so the call is very broad, but there are three very important aspects that we ask you to consider. Let me just uh, myself. Uh, yeah, now you can see everything. So first of all, we ask you to design uh, your solution for a specific market. That That's new in this edition, uh, but we really ask you to think about the group of people that you want to serve and do some research, go to the field, uh, and only then come up with your solution. The second one is that we ask you that your uh, solution is more sustainable than existing alternatives. So if you come up with a burger or what Stacy, the example that Stacy gave about the falafel, if we already have a falafel that is made of sustainable chickpeas, coming up with a falafel made of insect maybe doesn't make sense here. And the third element is this innovativeness and uniqueness. So we really want to push you to come up with something new. That's something that is not existing yet. So on one hand, you identify the uh, market need. On the other hand, you can identify or come up with a solution that uh, that uh, uh, answers it in a, in, a, in a way that has not been thought of before. This is the timeline of the challenge. So the challenge consists of three rounds. <clears throat> uh the first round uh is about coming up with uh, with your idea and making it as specific as possible it's relatively short uh phase that um ends with a selection round the selection round is based on your milestone report and in the handbook i think the link to the handbook will be soon uh, shared in the chat uh, there you can find more specific information about what is uh, required for the first milestone report. Uh, based on this report, we make a selection. Top 30 teams get to the second round. The second round, in my opinion, is the most interesting part of the challenge. That's where you get a lot of training. Um, <clears throat> you also get uh, to, uh, to, to know uh, a lot of people from the industry. They, they coach you, they give you advice. Um, 
and you we have a couple of webinars so so it's 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 quite intensive phase but also i think you learn a lot in that specific round it's also the also the longest round and it ends up with the second milestone report and at the end of the of this round we select 12 finalists six in uh, prototyping and six in ideation category now the last round is really the sprint towards the grand finale <clears throat> It's uh, the focus lies here on pitching, but you only have one month between the selection round and the grand finale, so so it's a very short round. <laughs> so I have mentioned the milestones. Let me just uh, here, yeah, um, yeah. Th this is a little bit of a summary. I mentioned those two reports in the handbook. You can find uh, more information about it. Besides that, you also work on your uh, team profile on our website. And uh, if you make it to the finals, you prepare a pitch presentation. You have interaction with the jury, which also counts for your performance. And a grand finale has a format of a, yeah, of a pre plenary event with a market where you present your idea. So it's also necessary to present your idea in a kind of market state. Now, I have mentioned that there are two categories, so ideation and prototyping. Uh, it's not that you choose the category when you join in the challenge. Uh, that's something that happens after the first selection round based on your report. So we kind of look how, how far are you with your idea and we make an estimation if you kind of will get it to the prototyping category. Because for the prototyping, at the end of the challenge you need to come up with a validated uh, minimal viable product and a completed business plan so if you are in that category you need to make steps faster you you really move faster than the ideation and it's also reflected in the prices so there are higher prices for the prototyping category than for ideation um now the challenge, it, it, it is of course a competition, but it's also a great opportunity to rethink protein challenge. So there are three main learning uh, experiences that you join if you are part of the challenge. Uh, the one, one of the most important highlights is this interactions with uh, coaches. <clears throat> coaches are uh, people from the industry that are partners of the challenge. Um, and you can uh, chat with them via online uh, we, via chat function in our online platform but we also have two speed date events when they take time to look at your project and give you very specific advice so if you are thinking about having starting a startup of course that's invaluable but also if you just are interested in uh, uh, in, in in the future in the sector this is the way to get to know people companies and make him maybe make the next career uh, step. Then we have online trainings. So basically, we we'll, we give you a training on communication, how to present your team, your project on on uh, social media. We give you a, uh, a training on pitching, so how to kind of craft your message so that it's powerful and uh, really very easily presentable. And we also give you a training on triple uh, or layer business model. It's a, it's a very interesting concept that you can use uh, anytime uh, yeah, for, for business ideas. And the third uh, learning element of the challenge are the webinars. Uh, well, today we had a presentation of Stacy. On 1st of December, we'll have a webinar on um, uh, plant alternatives uh, to meat. And uh, the, our intention is to organize a webinar monthly throughout the entire duration of the challenge and of course there are also prizes so probably you have seen it on the website uh, there is a one thousand uh, fifteen thousand euro uh, prize pool that's the winners of the ideation and prototyping category split amongst each other and we have uh, three winners in each category and as much as it's about winning, it's also about learning, and it's about uh, meeting people, getting inspired, getting into the topic. So that's why I have put those quotes from uh, the participants of the previous challenge here. 
from Agnani and from, from Fabiola. And if you want to learn a little bit more about how it was to participate in the challenge, we also put in the chat the link to the article where we interviewed the participants of the first edition one year after. So you can see how it was for them. Um, let me see. So, well, if you're excited, if you want to join, it's very easy. Uh, you just go to our website and you click on the Join the Challenge button. Uh, you need to join before 3rd of January and it's you can register individually, but basically you participate in the challenge in a team. So you have to form a team to be a part of the challenge and you have time until 3rd of January to do it. And I have seen in the chat that there were already some people looking for the teams, uh, rising a hand and saying, if you are uh, if you are looking for team members, I'm interested to join. Uh, that that's very good. Uh, you can also think about mobilizing your friends, getting in touch with your acquaintances or uh, uh, study mates. So, so so you can look around and get people motivated to join the challenge. Uh, there are some important things that you need to do, uh, to know. So uh, the team is minimum two, two people and max uh, it, it can consist of maximum 50 percent of uh, phd students also graduates graduate the people who already graduated from university are not eligible to participate in the challenge it was different in the previous edition but we decided to organize it a little bit different this year um, our online platform. So once you register for the challenge, you get access to online platform. Uh, this is where you can search for teams or individuals uh, who want to join the team. There is also uh, so uh, in the handbook that we have shared with you recently, there is a chapter called "Frequently Asked Questions," and there you can find some instructions on uh, how to join, uh, uh, how to look for team members and teams uh, in the platform. But as I said that that's a way but what we have noticed is if you really get people you know to join your team it's it's very powerful experience you really f uh, create a deep bonds it's more you develop friendships so it's also very yeah i would very much recommend trying to do that um so now the floor is yours I ask, what is your winning solutions? But I'm also here to answer any questions that you have about the challenge. I will move now to the chat to see what is happening there. Um, how many members can be there in the team? Uh, I see this question. There is no limit, basically. Of course, what we say is if your team is too big, you get a logistic issues. So. The, the ideal number is around six to eight. <clears throat> Minimum is two, but the sky is the limit. There were some, team, uh, there were some teams of six, 16 people, I remember in the past edition. It's not ideal, but it's, it is possible. Uh, I see Eva is asking uh, if I have graduated and have a bachelor, but I'm doing master. Am I able to join? Yes, uh, probably that's a little bit of a difference between <laughs> in English uh, terms. So bachelor, master and PhD students can join the challenge. If you graduated from university and you don't uh, uh, and you are not registered anymore at the university, then you cannot join the challenge. That's uh, that's the simple answer. Uh, Student who ends three undergrad, uh, I see this question from Ashan. Student who ends the undergraduate period after 3rd of January can participate, yes. So you need to be registered at the university at the moment of start of the challenge. <clears throat> what is the difference between master graduate and PhD student? Uh, well, if you are doing your master, you are master student. If you are PhD, doing your PhD, you are PhD student. <laughs> um, and if you have uh, graduated from university, so, so you are alumni, let's say, you have your diploma and now you are on the job market, then you are not eligible to participate in the challenge. Uh, 
<clears throat> uh, let me see. Uh, any eligibility criteria for joining the challenge? So I think that that's I th those are the elements that I have just mentioned a couple of minutes ago. And uh, to be sure, just check the handbook. We have mentioned it all there as well. Let me see. Will there be a dedicated networking webinar between uh, before 17 January to allow us to us to create or find a team? Yeah, this this is indeed a good question, Joanna. Um, so I was I was thinking about it, and um, well, I'm not sure. <laughs> it depends if there are quite, uh, some people if there are enough people interested. Definitely, we'll organize it. Uh, but often it happens that people prefer to uh, look for team members within their team. So, so I'm not sure what what's what's uh, yeah. If if there are a lot of thumbs up for such an event, I'm open to organize it. Uh, what I was also thinking about when I was looking at the list of people who has already registered uh, to the challenge, I have noticed that there are quite some people from, for instance from one university in Sri Lanka, I think, well, there were kind of clusters of uh, people who I thought maybe don't know each other. So I was thinking about introducing you to each other via email. Uh, that might be also a way of networking. <clears throat> Let me see yeah, how many team members are allowed. That has already been answered. Uh, yeah, I see also Meryl asking, how is the market stand organizing considered uh, considering COVID-19. So when it comes to grand finale, we really hope that it will be a nice live event in Wageningen. <clears throat> but we, of course, know uh, that the COVID can uh, change our plans. Uh, so what we have done last year with the Urban Greenhouse Challenge, we had a small, e small live event at the campus and big online events and people who were uh, joining us online they were kind of having an online connection and we had the qr codes uh, to scan the uh, to scan for more information about uh, their solution <clears throat> so let's say i don't know yet how it will look uh, exactly but we'll find a solution for that we see uh... I see here regarding the sustainability. That's a question from Julia. Should uh, should discover various aspects of the product and not be solely related to the formulation. <clears throat> and so uh, here I would like to uh, refer you to the handbook again. Uh, if you look at the list, uh, we we have created a kind of template for each of the reports and also a criteria list. So I think if you go through it, you will get quite a good idea of what we mean with uh, sustainability and how should it be represented. But if it's still not clear, just send me an email and I will try to answer it more in detail. Okay, now going a little bit up. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, I see also a question from Dimitris. Um, what about the courses that we have to register for the challenge? How does it work? Uh, this specific option is only uh, available to students of Wageningen University. Uh, so it works like this, that uh, here at Wageningen, we have a, a specific course that you can join if you are participating in a challenge. Um, for the others and, and Dimitris, I think it's best if you send me email about it, then I will answer it per email. For students from other universities, what I would like to recommend is that uh, you contact the person who is your study advisor or like uh, your contact person at the universities and, and explore the options because it could be possible that you also can get study uh, credits for joining the challenge, but it works differently than in Wageningen. And so, Try to explore the options and see if you can make it make the challenge part of your study program. Um, let's see, <clears throat> uh, yeah, Udita, you are asking: is uh, is a service solution allowed in the challenge? Yes, definitely. Uh, 
we we I think we even put it in a, on a description on on the on the on the website. Uh, and then I think Jeffrey is asking: Are solutions limited to food products? Can be uh, or can they also be production and agriculture focused? So I broadcast this question to the room. Yes, the answer is it's broad. So it's definitely not limited to food products. You can uh, really the the sky is the limit, as long as it uh, contributes to the uh, protein transition. Okay. See. Uh, and I see also a question from Gregorio. Uh, he's asking, his, uh, the question is, see? Me and a couple of friends are motivated to join the challenge. However, we are young and unexperienced second year bachelors. Would you suggest to make our own, own team or that we separate each other and join teams with all their experience, more experienced participants. Um, I think it, if you are good friends and, uh, and a good team together, it might be very, very interesting to try to form your own team. Uh, maybe you will might not make it to the uh, prototyping category, but end up as an ideation uh, team. Uh, but as I said, you get also throughout the challenge a lot of support from coaches uh get some training so it might really help you to to get this experience really boost your learning experience so i i would give it a try in that way let me see uh for graduates can we observe as audience yes definitely um if yeah i would uh recommend you to uh follow us on social media we are going to put uh, all our events there so so you can they are all free to join and uh, you can watch the webinars and you can also watch the uh kickoff meeting and main events of the challenge the trainings are unfortunately or unfortunately only for the participants so that would be more difficult to join and you can also uh subscribe for our newsletter on our website so those are the options to keep in the loop and uh, I hope to see you there then. Let me see. Uh, to contact you, what is your email address? Let me put it in the chat. Yes. Right. Uh, let me see if there are any. Uh, okay, I see here. What does. Uh, going fast in prototyping meets yes um well that depends how f if you join the challenge uh just with having a simple idea in your mind and you want to end up uh, uh with a prototype that means that you really have to put a lot of effort in your uh, submission because uh, that means that you not only need to very quickly decide okay what is my specific idea but you also have to put a lot of work in building your prototype and validating that. Uh, so, so that's what I mean with going fast, that you have to put a lot of effort and move the, from one step to another in a quite uh, speedy pace. See? It's so it's such a pity that I cannot see you guys. <laughs> It'd be much easier that way. Uh, I think we have most of the questions. And I see that Stacy has answered also the general questions. Mm. Let me see. Okay. Oh, yeah, I see also a question from Tim. What is the normal amount of time needed uh, to spend each week? We estimate eight hours per week. But you can read more about it in our handbook because, of course, it depends on the size of your team, on your role in the team, and as well on your ambitions as a team. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. 
has the presentation finished or is it about to start <laughs> olivier yes we are at the end of this presentation i'm taking the last questions now um okay can we focus development in meat protein sites? Yes, you can also think about uh, meat-related solutions. That's that's uh, open. Okay. Um, well, thanks everybody for joining. You will get from us uh, uh, an email with links to the uh, to the recording of this um, webinar, as well as to the handbook, to the website, and to the flyer that you can use to uh, motivate other people to join the challenge. Uh, I really hope to see you in the challenge and at the kickoff meeting and, of course, on the webinar of 1st of December. It was super nice to meet you and uh, have a good day, whether it's morning, evening or a middle of the day where you are. Thanks. Bye bye.